morning. Please be seated. It's a privilege to get to be sharing God's word with you this morning. Uh, I heard through the grapevine last week that our guest speaker, Brad List, attributed the crazy win over Penn State to God's blessing, RUF. And if you ask about uh, Saturday's game, I respond, no comment. But it is good to be together, and uh, we come now to, actually, this is the third sermon in a series that I've been preaching periodically here at All Souls, that in some way or another centers around the ascension of Jesus. And for the sake of time, I won't go into a lot of review, uh, but last time in Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, we saw how our ascended Lord Jesus is our prophet, our king, and our priest. He shows us who God is as our prophet. He rules over us and conquers our enemies as our king. And he offers a cleansing sacrifice for sins on our behalf as our priest. And this week, we're looking at another passage from Hebrews 2, uh, verses 10 through 18. You can start turning there in your Bibles or pull it up on the digital version of the bulletin to read along in a moment. But we're going to be zooming in on another aspect of Jesus' priestly work for us. Uh, The good news for sinners and sufferers like you and me is that Jesus didn't just pay our sins once and for all in the past, even though that's incredibly important, but he also continues to help us today as our priest. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Theologians have often described this as the intercessory work of Christ. He intercedes for us. He stands in the gap. He acts as an advocate, and he continues to help us on our journey towards heaven. So let's turn now to Hebrews 2, verses 10 through 18, and see the kind of help that Jesus, our priest, offers us. Listen carefully, because this is God's word. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham." Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Please pray with me. O Father, we come now to hear from your word, and we come in particular to hear of our Lord Jesus, who's able to help us. I pray that even as we listen together, as we sit under the teaching of your word, that he would be our helper, and that you would be helping us by your spirit to understand, to believe, to respond, and to obey for your glory. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. A few weekends ago, a small group of RUF students and I went to a 5K run here in town in support of Cunningham Christian Home, or Cunningham Children's Home, a Christian nonprofit. And uh, we showed up at this 5K event, uh, which was a fundraiser. Uh, We did a little bit of setting up at the beginning, a little bit of cleaning up at the end. But the main reason we were there uh, was to cheer on the runners. Uh, We made signs, we jumped up and down, we had some half-hearted ILL chants thrown in there. Um, But we were there to cheer on the runners, because running a 5K can be hard. We wanted to encourage them in their race. And if you're a Christian today, uh, the moment you trusted in Jesus, God plucked you off of the path that leads to destruction and placed you on the path that leads to life. 
I remember the words of Jesus in the gospel. Wide is the path that leads to destruction, but the path that leads to life is narrow. But that's what Jesus has done for you. He's placed you on the path. But the Christian life, as this uh, illustration suggests, is a journey. It's like a 5K, maybe even more fittingly. It's a, it's a lifelong marathon. So we need to see how Jesus himself actually cheers us on on the race. And, and that's the big idea today that I hope, I hope we'll see from God's word, that Jesus, as our priest, is actually giving us all the help that we need so that we can continue on this path to glory. So when we consider this passage, um, especially looking at verse 10 for this first point, but we'll be uh, examining the whole passage together, I think the first thing that ought to strike us is that Jesus, our priest, is also our pioneer or pathfinder. Now let's, let's look at verse 10 again together. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. It was fitting that he, the Father, uh, would, in bringing many sons to glory, that's talking about you and me, would make Jesus, the founder of their salvation, perfect through suffering. That word founder, towards the end of that verse, uh, is a very loaded word. Uh, it could also be translated um, originator, leader, captain. But I, th I think the word that's most fitting is this idea of a pioneer. So what, what do you think of when you hear the word pioneer? If you're like me, you might think of Lewis and Clark being guided by Sacagawea. You might think of Davy Boone and his uh, raccoon skin cap. Uh, but what, is it, what does a pioneer do? A pioneer is someone who goes ahead where others have not yet gone. They pave the way, they blaze the trail in anticipation of others following after them. And that's who Jesus is for us in this passage. He's, our, he's the founder of our salvation, the pioneer of our salvation. And I'm curious if, if you ever think about Jesus that way. If I ask you to describe who Jesus is for you, you might say, he is my king. He's my savior. He's my friend. He's my teacher. And all of those things are very good and true and biblical. But I think we get pretty far down the list before we said that Jesus is our pioneer. And yet we need a pioneer. We need a pioneering priest who runs the race ahead of us, uh, the very path that God has called us to follow. So that's what Jesus does in verse 10 in particular. Now let's take a step back and see how Jesus is actually able to do this for us. What qualifies him to be this kind of pioneer? The big answer to that question is given in verse 17. It says he's able to do this because he was made like his brothers in every respect. And then there are different parts of the, the big passage we read together that gets more specific. Verse 11 says that he who sanctifies, that's Jesus, and those who are being sanctified have the same source. What that means is Jesus, like the rest of us, is from the human family. He was taken from the pool of humanity so he can represent us as he runs ahead. We see also that in verse 14, it says that Jesus was made up of the same stuff as you and me, the flesh and blood that we all have, because he didn't just appear to be human, he, he was fully human. Verse 14 also says that Jesus faced the terrors of death, just like we all do. So in this passage, we're being presented with a pioneer who's able to help us because he stands in ultimate solidarity with us. And for him to do that, he had to be fully human. And for Jesus to be fully human, God's word says, he had to suffer. Verse 10 says that God the Father made Jesus perfect through suffering. Now, that might strike your ears as kind of strange language. Uh, you might think, well, isn't Jesus sinless? Isn't he God? And in what sense is he being made perfect and the answer to those first couple questions is, yes, of course, he is sinless, he is God. But for Jesus to be made perfect here is not a movement from sinfulness to sinlessness. 
He is without sin. But it's a movement uh, towards being fully equipped to be the kind of priest that we all need. It's a movement for the perfect son of God to become the perfect savior of his people. But if we get hung up on that word perfect, I think we actually miss the bigger mystery of what this passage is communicating. And that is that Jesus was equipped to be our priest through suffering. I mean, this would have been incomprehensible to to ancient minds, Greek or Jew. It would have been incomprehensible to associate suffering with the divine. How could God suffer? And maybe, maybe the better question is, why would he? We see the answer in verse 10. God the Father perfected Jesus through suffering in order to bring many sons to glory. In other words, all of Jesus' suffering, uh, not just his death on the cross, though certainly that, but all of his suffering from his early pains of childhood to the very end to his death and his burial had a purpose, and that purpose was for you for you to be carried along with him to the place of glory. Now, that word glory in our passage um, shouldn't make us think of fame or reputation, although it is sometimes used that way in the Bible. Uh, It's really an allusion to the presence of the Father, the glorious place where God resides, even now in the heavens. And then at the last day when Jesus comes back and makes all things new and we're with God and a new heavens and a new earth. That place, that place of transcendent beauty and joy. So what does this mean for you today? To know that Jesus is our pioneer, that he's run the race ahead of us, that he suffered and died and then rose and ascended so that we might do those very things, that we might be a people who are suffering and even face death and yet can have the hope of resurrection and ascension. Of, of being in the glorious place with the Father. Well, I pray that, that what it will do for you, as it has for me, is it will give you hope in the middle of your suffering. I remember uh, early on in our marriage, Amanda and I were traveling uh, to a wedding, and I got a phone call from uh, my dad. And on that phone call, my dad told me uh, that my Nana had passed away. And uh, as you can imagine, it was heartbreaking news. It wasn't very surprising, uh, but I was sad. And yet, the hope of this wedding that I was traveling towards gave me comfort in the middle of my sorrow. And the same can be true for you and me. We are all headed for the place of glory, the wedding supper of the Lamb, if you trust in Jesus. And I don't say that to slap a band-aid on your suffering if you're facing hard things right now, but we can have hope, whether we're struggling with bad health or bad relationships, uh, with a bad marriage, with bad grades. I mean, fill in the blank. We can have hope because the ascended Christ is bringing us to the place that he's gone. He's our pioneer. And even though we can't always see it, your suffering is actually a part of the path that God has laid out for you to get there. So Jesus is your pioneering priest. Let's turn now our attention to verses 11 through 13. I'm not going to read them again for the sake of time. Uh, But here we're going to see Jesus as our presenting priest. That's maybe unfamiliar language. What do we mean by that? Well, the end of verse 11 gives us the basic message of this section. And then it goes on to offer three quotes from the Old Testament that function like proof texts. Uh, pieces of evidence in favor of that central message, which is Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call you his brother or his sister. The first quote from the Old Testament is in verse 12, and that's from Psalm 22. Uh, You'll notice that we read this psalm earlier in our service, and you might recognize it because it's actually a psalm that is quoted all over the New Testament, but it's usually quoted towards the beginning of the psalm, uh, even the opening line, where it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those are the words that our Lord Jesus quoted, prayed to the Father as he was hanging on the cross, paying the penalty for our sins. But here, the quote is from later in the psalm, 
uh, that's not full of words of lament or complaint or pleas for God's help as it, as it is the case earlier in the psalm. Here, Psalm 22 is full of words of thanksgiving and praise. And even that movement from lament to thanksgiving is instructive for us in the Christian life. Jesus has paved the path for us so that our, our, the natural thing we should expect is crying out to God and experiencing deliverance. It is ordinary in the Christian life that there would be a movement from lament to praise, from suffering to glory, from death to resurrection, from burial to ascension. Now, these words are spoken by Jesus from Psalm 22, and in the context of Hebrews 2, uh, it's presenting Jesus, it's casting him in the role of a priest. And a priest does lots of things. We talked about that some last time. They make sacrifices for the cleansing of sins. But one of the things that priests did in the Old Testament was to lead God's people in worship. Uh, Look at what it says in that first quote. He's telling of God's name to his brothers in the congregation. So we see Jesus is being presented here as, as the ultimate priest. And as the ultimate priest, he's also the ultimate worship leader. Have you ever thought about that before? What what are we actually doing when we gather together on Sundays? We gather to sing to Jesus, about Jesus, with Jesus. It's amazing. Yes, we're praying Jesus with the Father and the Son, and yet our worship is centered on him. We're praising him, and yet he is also leading us as we praise. It's amazing, and I, I think... Where the rubber really hits the road for us is, at least in my experience, I've found that my experience of worship, what I, at least in my limited vision, get out of it, is often impacted by the people I'm worshiping with and the person who's leading me. When you're worshiping with people that you know and love and that know and love you, your worship feels more joyful. When someone is leading you and you know that they know and love you and you respect them and you have a relationship, the worship can feel more significant. And that's not an altogether bad thing, but the good news is that no matter where we are, when we gather as God's people to worship, Jesus is with us and Jesus is leading us. I'm not the worship leader today. Pastor Luke and the elders aren't the worship leaders today. Our gifted musicians aren't the worship leaders today. Jesus ultimately is leading us in worship. So let's turn now and consider these next two verses, or these next two quotes in this section. Uh, We're going to consider them together. I encourage you to be looking along in your Bible as I share. Uh, Because both of these quotes, the reason we can see them together is they're both from Isaiah chapter 8. And here Jesus is taking on the words of the prophet Isaiah for two reasons. He's identifying himself with Isaiah to make the point that he trusts God even in the middle of suffering and rejection. The prophet Isaiah lived a hard life. He preached God's message to his people, and it was not well received. Yet Jesus, the greater Isaiah, was perfectly faithful even unto death. And second, the second point, by identifying himself with Isaiah, he's presenting himself and his children, which here is a reference to believers, as testimonies to the watching world about God's faithfulness to his word. Isaiah had three children with strange names that I'm not going to mention, but the meaning of their names was itself a message, and their very presence among God's people was a testimony that God is true to his word. And part of the message we need to see is that Jesus says that you are a part of that testimony to the watching world, that God is faithful to his word. I think that adds some some weight and some significance to the way that we live our lives. But what I I really want to focus on here before we consider our final point together is that Jesus isn't just shamelessly calling you brother or sister, as we saw in verse 11. He's also claiming you as his child. And remember, 
the context here is a worship service. It's an assembly in praise to God. He claims you in the presence of the Father. I said a moment ago that when we gather together, we're singing to Jesus, about Jesus, with Jesus. He's our worship leader. But what's almost too good to be true in this passage, something that we're being told is that when Jesus leads us in worship, one of the things that he praises God for is you. One of the things that he thanks God for is for giving you to him, that you would be his brother, his sister, and his child. He's not just not ashamed of you. Jesus actually boasts about you. There, uh, there are a lot of stories from the 20th century of older brothers coming back um, from serving overseas in different wars. And I heard one of these stories once, uh, and it really struck me, and I want to share it with you. I don't know the names of these two brothers, so we're going to call them Jim, the older brother who went off to war, and John, the younger brother who stayed behind. Well, Jim went off and served. John was still in school. Um, he was in grade school when the war began and in middle school by the time his brother came back. And, and Jim went over and served valiantly. Uh, he came back as a decorated war veteran. Uh, but his family didn't know the exact time of his arrival. So when Jim came back into town, he decided he was going to go to his brother John's school and surprise him. And maybe you've seen... Uh, videos of reunions uh, when servicemen or servicewomen come back from overseas. It can be an incredibly emotional thing, and that's just what happened. Uh, Jim shows up in his uniform. He sneaks to his brother's classroom, and they embrace one another and laugh and cry and experience the joy of that reunion. But what happens next is such a beautiful picture of what Jesus does for us. Here's Jim, this man worthy of honor for his sacrifice and his valor. And he comes to his brother, and after greeting him, he lifts his brother up on his shoulder. And he begins to parade his brother around the school. And as he's parading his brother around the school, he's telling the other school children, this is my brother John. I'm so proud of him. Can you imagine how John would have felt in that moment to have his hero older brother parading him around and boasting about him to his friends? Well, that's, that's just an imperfect picture of who Jesus is for us. He parades us before the Father and boasts about us. And I wish we had more time to think about how this impacts our day-to-day -day lives, but the one thing I want to say is that, remember, Hebrews was written to people who were being tempted to turn away from the faith. They were being tempted to stop following Jesus and go back to the old ways of biblical Judaism. They were being tempted to be ashamed of Jesus. So I, I don't know how you are being tempted to be ashamed of Jesus today. I think that can look um, like a lot of different things. But there is no better antidote for our temptation to shame our temptation to stay away from being associated with Jesus or his people in one way or another than to hear Jesus boasting about you to the Father. Well, finally, I want us to consider together just for a few minutes how Jesus is our providing priest. We've seen his provision already in this passage. He's provided a pathway to glory, to the presence of the Father as our pioneer, He's provided for us a way to present ourselves to the world as a testimony to who God is. And he's provided for us a, a boasting with the Father. Not only does his blood cover our guilt, but his boasting covers our shame. Finally, in verses 14 to 18, I want us to see how Jesus provides even more for us as we await our own ascensions, our own arrival in the place of glory. And these verses really give us a few different complementary, not contradictory, answers uh, to the all-important question, why did Jesus die? If you're exploring Christianity today, if you don't know if you're a believer or not, that's a great question to ask and to seek an answer from in God's word. Why did Jesus die? 
And verse 18 gives us the most general answer. It says he suffered to help us. That word help is usually used in the Greek version of the Old Testament. It's a technical word that means God's help for his people. It's usually not used to talk about people helping each other. It's God helping his people. And that's who Jesus is. He's the ultimate provision of the Father. He's the ultimate expression of God's help toward his needy people. But we we also get some more particular answers to why Jesus died. Verse 17 gives another one, and that is to make propitiation. That's a strange word. It means to satisfy the wrath of God. That we, because of our sin, justly deserved God's righteous wrath and punishment. And yet Jesus took that on himself so that we could be free. And that is super important. Uh, We talked about that more last time. Uh, But I want us to actually focus on another reason Jesus died in verse 15, where it says he died to deliver those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Jesus died to take away your guilt and replace it with his righteousness. He died to take away your shame and replace it with his boasting. And here we see that Jesus, by his death, killed death. He broke death's back. He triumphed over death and the devil so that he could take away your bondage. Not just the guilt of your sin, but the power of sin in your life. Even particularly here, the power that the fear of death has to keep us from living a life for God's glory. And he replaces that bondage with a free and confident life as we journey towards heaven. If we are to see the ongoing help Jesus offers us on our race, we need to see that Jesus' help, yes, it was secured on the cross, but it's present with you today. He's saved you from the powerful sway of the devil. So that means no matter how weak and far from God you feel right now, no matter how ugly and shameful you feel, Jesus is with you, and he's going to help you on your race. And because he suffered before us and died before us, we can actually know that his provision doesn't come from a distance. In one sense, Jesus stands at the end of our journey and beckons us onward. But in another sense, he's running right alongside us. I want to close with uh, the story about uh, Dick and Rick Hoyt. I don't know if those names are familiar to any of you. Uh, But Rick Hoyt, in 1977... Uh, was suffering from a severe case of cerebral palsy. And in 1977, uh, this man who was confined to a wheelchair because of this disease asked his father to help him run a five-mile race. So Rick asked his father, Dick, and and Dick is a man, he's in his mid-30s. He's not especially fit. Uh, He's a little bit like me. Uh, But he decides, I'm going to show my love for my son. I'm going to train for this race so that we can run this race together. Well, 12 years later, they actually run their first of many Ironmans together. An Ironman is a, about a two and a half mile swim, a 112 mile bike, and a marathon at the end. I mean, th- this is a crazy race. And in, in this race, Dick pulled his son uh, in a special boat that was made during the swim. He, he rode with him, and his son, his adult son, in the seat in front of him during the bike ride, and then he pushed his son in a special wheel, wheelchair across the finish line. And we know that Dick did this, and it's, an, it's incredibly motivating to see his love for his son. But what gives us some context for that is what Rick told his father back after their very first race in 1977. He said, Dad, when I'm running, it feels like I'm not handicapped. So his father would go to whatever length to help his son to feel that. And Jesus does the same thing for us. He's not just calling us onward from a distance. He's running the race with you today. He's run ahead of you. He's your pioneer. He's boasting about you even now to the Father and will again at the last day. And he's running with you right now as you await your arrival in the presence of the Father. Amen.
Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you give us all the help we need to run the race that God has set before us. I thank you for this vision from your word of the kind of help that you give us. You call us onward, you've run ahead, and you also are running with us. I ask that you would take these beautiful truths from your word and apply them to our hearts, whether we are suffering or struggling, whether we are wrestling with our sin or the ways that others have sinned against us. I pray that you would comfort us that you would call us onward, that we would resist the temptation to turn away from you in the many different ways that can take place. And we, we long that you would be with us by your spirit until the day when we see you face to face, until we arrive in glory. I pray all of this in your name. Amen.